Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. What would you say is the most important training variable? I'd say how close to failure you train with your repetitions is arguably the most important. Simply because getting close to failure ensures high muscle fiber recruitment and tension, which are critical for stimulating muscle hypertrophy. But how close to failure are we talking about? Do you actually need to train to failure? The point where you physically cannot perform another full repetition. Some believe reaching this is necessary for various reasons. One is that training to failure ensures we squeeze out as many so-called effective reps as possible. On the other hand, others say it's sufficient to stop a few reps short of failure, perhaps 3 to 1 reps from failure. Some say this better balances stimulus and fatigue. A brand new study, which I'd say is the best designed one to date, has compared training to failure to stopping short of failure. Let us dissect this paper, fit it into the rest of the research, and then provide some recommendations to help you more effectively put on muscle. At least five things make this study truly well designed. We'll reveal these as we describe the protocol and results of the study. The researchers recruited 18 trained individuals with an average of 7.7 .7 years of training experience. This is the first great thing as this is the highest level of experience to date in studies exploring training to failure. Half of them had competed in powerlifting or bodybuilding. The subjects performed the unilateral leg press and unilateral leg extension twice per week for 8 weeks. With one leg, they performed all sets to complete momentary muscular failure. There is actually footage of one of the researchers supervising a subject going to failure. And this assures us we can be confident failure was indeed reached. Fatality. With their other leg, all leg press sets were performed with two repetitions in reserve. That is, they stopped at the point they felt two more reps could be completed all leg extension sets were performed with one repetition in reserve. You may be thinking, how do I know if subjects accurately judge they had one or two reps in reserve? Well, the researchers tested their accuracy before the study, and it was found they were highly accurate. They were off by less than one repetition in both a one rep in reserve and three reps in reserve test. So I believe we can be fairly confident the subjects were more or less hitting the targets. Here is also footage of a leg press set performed with two repetitions in reserve. So this is the second great thing. We have reason to be confident subjects train sufficiently hard. The third great thing is the simple fact each subject trained both conditions. One leg trained to failure and the other not to failure. In other words, the same people were in the failure and non-failure conditions, which means that factors that differ between subjects, like genetics, nutritional intake, and outside lifestyle, are less likely to confound our results. Moreover, this design also means we have more subjects in each condition. Compare this to if we just assigned 18 subjects into either a failure and non-failure group, we just have 9 subjects in each condition. It is valuable to know the number of dominant legs was equally split in each condition, and every session alternated which leg was trained first. How many sets did the subjects perform? The researchers recorded how many sets for the quads each subject performed in their regular training before the study, and each subject continued training with this number throughout the study. For example, say a subject was performing 12 weekly sets for the quads before the study. In this study, they performed 12 weekly sets equally divided between the exercises and the training sessions. Halfway through the study, set numbers were increased by 20%. So with our 12 weekly set example, you'd now be performing 14 weekly sets. This is the fourth great thing. Some studies just have all subjects perform identical set numbers. But the problem with doing this is some subjects may be performing way more or way fewer sets than they're usually accustomed to which possibly confounds the study. As an additional note, during the training sessions, subjects rested 4 minutes between leg press sets and 2 minutes between leg extension sets. 
Loads were increased whenever necessary to keep subjects reaching the desired proximity to failure within the specified rep ranges. The fifth and final great thing was the researchers had subjects track their nutrition with an app that gave them individualized protein, carb, fat, and overall calorie targets to attain a monthly weight gain of 1%. Here are the average nutritional intake and body weight changes across the eight weeks. There is a very interesting finding surrounding regional hypertrophy that we'll uncover in a second. But first, overall quadriceps growth, which was the average of the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis in this case, was similar between both conditions. In other words, leaving one to two reps in reserve was able to produce similar growth to training to failure. This is in line with what other scientific papers have found. Now, there was a meta-regression last year that seemingly suggested training to failure is superior, but as I detailed in a previous video, I believe this meta-regression is evidence of how getting close to failure is required. But as the authors of that paper mentioned, there were key considerations that meant it absolutely does not prove training to failure is superior. Besides that, we have other meta-analyses which combine the results of numerous individual studies Finding muscle growth is similar between training to failure and not training to failure. And here are the summaries of three other papers that I think are well designed. Finding not training to failure was similar to training to failure for hypertrophy. The numbers in the papers imply the subjects not training to failure were probably stopping three or fewer reps from failure, with the majority of training likely leaving one to two reps in reserve. I alluded to an interesting finding about regional hypertrophy. What was I talking about? Remember the quadriceps growth in this study was averaged from the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis. However, when looking at just the vastus lateralis, the growth slightly favored the leg that trained to failure. But when looking at the rectus femoris, the growth slightly favored the leg that did not train to failure. The researchers provide a fascinating speculation. The leg press was always trained before the leg extension in the training sessions. There's evidence, as will be uncovered in future videos at the House of Hypertrophy, that the leg press better grows the vastus lateralis, while the leg extension better grows the rectus femoris. With the leg that trained to failure, failure might have maximized the stimulus on the leg press and thus explains the better vastus lateralis growth, but the fatigue from this may have subsequently impaired the stimulus on the leg extension thus explaining the slightly worse rectus femoris growth. If true, this suggests an intriguing interaction between failure and exercise order. Although, there is evidence against this. Specifically, this paper was briefly presented earlier. It had trained individuals also perform the leg press before the leg extension, with one leg going to complete failure and the other leg likely stopping one to two reps from failure. These researchers only measured vastus lateralis hypertrophy, and if the logic stated moments ago is true, we'd expect the failure leg to see slightly better vastus lateralis hypertrophy. But this didn't happen. The gains were actually non-significantly better for the non-failure leg. So in total, I don't think we can definitely say what explains these slight hypertrophy differences. Before providing some key takeaways, it is worth touching on fatigue. The researchers took indirect neuromuscular fatigue measurements during the training sessions, and they partially suggest that as the weeks went by, training to failure somewhat improved fatigue resistance on the leg press. For those interested in the details behind this, I describe this in the pinned comment. Anyhow, the researchers didn't measure fatigue and recovery in the days after the training sessions, but we can generally be confident recovery is always going to be quicker when not training to failure. For example, this paper had trained individuals perform six sets on the barbell bench press. Training to failure on all sets led to slower recovery and more soreness compared to leaving one and three reps in reserve. Considering this, if you're someone trying to limit fatigue for a variety of potential reasons, this is best done by not training to failure. Yet, this absolutely does not mean the fatigue from training to failure is always concerning and unmanageable we've clearly seen it doesn't harm growth in many cases. Moreover, as described previously at the House of Hypertrophy, 
I think it's likely as you accustom yourself to training to failure, your body produces a range of adaptations that partly reduce the fatigue, damage, and soreness you experience. It can be tricky and very challenging to construct your own muscle building program, but the Alpha Progression app, which is essentially your personal clever muscle building assistant in the palm of your hand, can easily help you. With hundreds of thousands of downloads, thousands of reviews speak to its unmatched quality. Other apps truly generate garbage programs, but this app intelligently gets you closer to your dream physique through generating an evidence-based program 100% customizable to your needs. Simply let it know all about you, your experience level, the equipment you have, how often and how long you can train for, and if you want to focus or neglect certain muscles. This can all take less than a minute, and you can still make further edits if you like. The app has extra impressive features. During workouts, the app's algorithm carefully suggests how you may progressive overload to help push you to the next level. Aesthetic graphs automatically display your long-term progress, and there is a huge exercise database of all the best muscle building exercises. Try out every single one of the premium features to your heart's desire during a free two-week trial through the link in the comments and description. If you like it and choose to go beyond, the link cuts the price of a subscription by 20%. I truly believe the app is exceptional, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. Stopping a few reps short of failure seems to be able to produce similar muscle growth to training to failure. However, there are three final things you may consider. Remember that in the new study, subjects were performing the same number of sets they were accustomed to, with a 20% increase midway through the study. The authors noted this resulted in subjects largely performing 10 to 17 weekly sets for the quads throughout the study. Much of the other well-designed literature on training to failure used 6 to 19 weekly sets per muscle group. Thus, the results are specific to this broad set number range. Some people may like to train with a very low number of weekly sets per muscle group. We know this is likely not optimal for hypertrophy on average. But we've described previously how this can be a time-efficient way to see some fair growth. In this context, it's possible training to failure is better. In fact, this study had subjects largely perform two weekly sets per muscle group. One group went to complete failure, while another stopped just shy of failure. Muscle mass increases were better with training to failure. Although, the muscle mass measures in this paper were not the most precise, so more studies are needed to validate this. But if you are someone who trains with a very low number of weekly sets per muscle group, it is generally more manageable to train to failure. The second consideration is it's entirely possible to combine both failure and non-failure training into a program. There could be benefits to this, and it would be neat to have future studies exploring combining both. In any case, one benefit is that regularly having some failure in your program can keep you accustomed to how failure feels which could help your accuracy when you choose to leave reps in reserve. The third consideration is the type of exercise. Currently, the majority of the highest quality literature on training to failure has trained the quads, a muscle group that is tough to train to failure. But with isolation exercises that train smaller muscles, it is relatively easier and less demanding to train to failure. In fact, some might suggest with these kinds of exercises, Training to failure is superior, but the current limited evidence isn't crystal clear. One study seems to suggest that with a barbell biceps curl, training to failure was superior to leaving around 3 or 4 reps in reserve, but another suggests with the same exercise, leaving 1 or 2 reps in reserve was similar to failure. Anyhow, if you're happy and capable of doing so, you may choose to push the failure on the majority of your upper body isolation work. Thank you for watching. Feel free to check out the Alpha Progression app or our recent deep dive into building the lats.